All right, thanks for being here today on this very rainy Friday. Um, today, you are going to hear about the brilliant Dr. Daniel Vecchi talk about large area analysis and the scanning electron microscope. And I'll kick it off to Dan. Cool. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm gonna check and make sure I think that's working for people online. Uh, for anyone online, um, let me know if you can't hear anything. Um, Ashley's helping take care of that today. We can get started. Um, so um, I'm excited to be here kind of in person. Um, it's nice actually seeing some half faces today. Um, and you know, this online and in person is kind of a cool thing that we've been able to get going along here. Um, so um, to mention, Ashley introduced what I'm gonna talk about today. I'll mention that a little more in a second. Um, but there's gonna be two more talks for the rest of the semester um, coming up for next month. So usually we have these at the end of the month, but with Thanksgiving, we bumped it back a week to the first week of December. Uh, Sarah McQuill will be giving a talk about biological sample prep, um, doing resident bedding for that. And then we have a special talk uh, by Professor Peter Rez from Arizona State, looking at um, high resolution yields in the TEM. Yeah. Um, so you guys have seen it before a lot about this webinar. So with my talk today, I'm going to talk about large area analysis in the SEM. Um, kind of some of the considerations you want to think about when you're trying to look at um, any kind of almost imaging in the SEM, along with why you might want to do some large area mapping, um, or um, I've used cases from a lot of different techniques, EBSD, EDS, um, and that sort of thing in there. Um, at the end, I'm going to do a demo um, live. So hopefully that works out well, and you can kind of see um, some of the uses of mapping. Um, again, I like to keep these talks short, so I'm planning on around 30 minutes. Uh, if you're online, um, submit lots of questions in the Q&A. Uh, if you have problems, go ahead and submit those in the chat. In person, feel free to interrupt me a little bit if you have questions, and I'll try and uh, bring those up for discussion as well. But again, we have hours scheduled. Um, and just ask lots of questions if you have anything. Um, mentioned before, lots of things you can do at CMAS, so either attending beyond the scope like you are now, um, or any of the instrument managers love to talk about their instruments, techniques, so feel free to reach out to us. I have my email up there for SEM. Um, you can find any of the instrument managers on the website or email CMAS to kind of get started with that route. Uh, so I wanted to mention a little bit of my background. Um, so you get to know me, um, if you've seen this before, I did my undergraduate at New Mexico Tech, where actually I started off as an engineer, got kind of bored with engineering as a chemical engineer, got really interested in chemistry, um, and did organic synthesis. Uh, from there, I went to Penn State, I thought I was going to do organic synthesis, and again, if you guys have run columns, as soon as you start running so many columns in there, you kind of bored with it. I rotated with a group looking at atmospheric chemistry, doing a lot of instrumentation work. And that's kind of the group I ended up joining, and that's what brought me into the electron microscopy field was looking at um, atmospheric aerosol particles. Um, after that, so far I've kind of worked at three different characterization facilities. I started um, at the Penn State Materials Characterization Lab, where I had kind of similar positions to what I had now. Uh, from there, I did a lot of work out at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, where again, a user facility where I worked with users, but I was really focused on kind of in situ work and then also um, in the atmospheric realm. So it kind of brought all that together really nicely. And then I had the opportunity to come out to CMAS. And my main interest, uh, main thing I work on a lot is the Quattro, um, but I work with all the SEMs to do a lot of different things in there. So, in addition to that, um, free time, um, what you'll find be doing is being outside basically as much as possible. So um, hiking, disc golfing, that sort of thing. Um, I was lucky I was able to just take a vacation to Iceland. Um, so you can see there's a nice ice cave back there um, that we're able to see. Um, also, um, right now is not a great day for outdoor stuff, as you guys have seen walking in here. So um, during that time, I've been spending a lot of time in my wood shop. So we had a literal ton of walnut mills that I've been slowly working through. And one of the projects I finished up last year um, was a desk 
um, there. So a nice live edge slab that goes over. And that's pre-finish. I don't have a good picture of it post-finishing. But lots of different things about me. Um, so again, what I'm going to end up talking about is going to be our SEMs. But a lot of this work kind of does tie into um, work with other instruments at our facility. So um, in the TEM side of things, we do have our techno instruments that are really nice for um, more analytical work um, through to high resolution uh, TEMs with the Titan Themis and then cryoside as well. Um, or um, prep for a lot of that kind of work is in the uh, focused ion beam uh, that we do on our Helios or Nova. Um, with this talk, again, I'll focus on SEM with um, a lot of these capabilities available on our Abrio and Quattro instruments. Uh, so most people here probably have an idea of what SEM is. Uh, for those that are not very familiar with it, I want to quickly introduce it in a slide and why we might want to use it. Um, so in the SEM, it's going to be a chamber that's under high vacuum, and you have an electron source, um, some kind of a source. So on this instance, we're talking about your field emission sources, tungsten sources, lab six, that kind of thing. Um, sorry. Um, where your electron beams would come down, it's going to go through a bunch of different um, electromagnetic lenses to help focus your beam down. And then scanning electron microscopy, it's going to have scanning to go across your sample. Um, from there, your beam scan your sample, scan across there, and you'll um, be producing backscattered electrons, um, secondary electrons, x-rays, um, photons, a lot of different signals you can analyze. Um, so if you're interested in any of those techniques, I know we've had talks on that before um, where you can ask me about them and we can always chat about that. Um, but with this, the real reasons of why you want to use SEM is um, you can get down to some nanometer resolution, um, atomic number contrast with your backscatter imaging, again, characteristic x-rays with your elemental analysis, um, and a lot of um, diffraction data for crystallographic information. So those are going to be things I'll talk about today. Um, in the talk with different use cases. So um, most of you when you're thinking about imaging, um, you're looking at a sample top down. And optimally uh, for these surfaces, um, you're going to be looking at something more or less top down. Um, so either you'll have a sample with just a little bit of topography where you're not going to miss any features um, or something with a really flat surface. So in this case, you can see if you're a uh, small area, small amount of topography, you can kind of start to resolve those features and understand what they are, or it's a flat one, you can actually look at a much larger area because you're not going to have um, the beam kind of at a weird angle from there. So um, I've always liked the analogy of this as kind of, you've seen all seen the drone shots of like a forest, right? Looking from above. So again, if you're looking at just kind of a small area, um, this is a image of a Christmas tree farm, you're looking down at your features, you can actually analyze them, you could do nice data analysis with this. But if you're looking at something with a really high topography um, or that really large field of view, you start running into some problems. Um, if you're trying to characterize this, um, you might have problems where it can't differentiate some because there's overlap in these Christmas trees um, or um, trying to get diameter, um, any inhomogeneity in the structure from above. So you want to think about using some different kinds of scan strategies to mitigate these effects on the samples. Um, so the use cases that I kind of want to talk about today um, uh, for this large area mapping is often finding a small feature on a large sample. Um, I don't know how many hours I've spent, hundreds, thousands of hours, trying to find a specific feature on a sample. Um, that can be actually a lot of time in the SEM. Um, so sometimes it can be useful to do like a large area map beforehand, uh, figure out where it is, and do that so you can navigate back. And we'll see how to do that a little bit. And again, like I talked about with the example there, was imaging large features um, at a high resolution, um, reduce that distortion. And then um, if you have these large area maps, it can often be easier to correlate the electron image to a high resolution electron image and those lower resolution ones back to um, other imaging techniques such as light microscopy, um, AFM, um, even down to TM if you're trying to go for higher resolution work. 
So the first example that I want to talk about here um, is um, uh, out of manufacturing sample of titanium. Um, so Mayor Xiao from the Yinchek group um, did this work um, a couple of years ago with us. And it was a really interesting example of trying to um, get this methodology working very well and also understanding um, how to deal with the data afterwards. Um, so you can see um, with our sample here, um, it's multi-layered sample, and you're interested in picking out this plane. So normally what you do, cut your sample down to the plane you want, polish it, and then start imaging it. So in this case, um, what you did originally was look at kind of three different areas. So you could see something right near the edge, um, halfway towards the middle, and towards the middle again. Um, it gives you a good idea of kind of what's there, but if you're starting to see some differences in your sample, you're wondering where these transitions are actually starting to occur. Um, so if you're wondering about that, um, then you might want to start imaging much larger areas. And again, you can see that you'll need very high resolution across here, and the sample is 15 by 15 millimeters, so it's um, relatively large. Um, what we ended up doing um, was some maps imaging of the sample. Um, so here's a low res um, image of the final stitched image. And it's um, over 400 images um, at a pixel width of two, uh, 25 nanometers. So if you're at 25 nanometers over millimeters, um, that's going to be a lot of pixels. Uh, you can go in, look at your data, um, and characterize this. They're really interested in the uh, beta phase of their sample, and they're able to get that from there. So it's really good to be able to do that. Um, I'm going to just say the caveats of doing this work um, is this sample, in order to get nice enough images to do this, it took um, between eight to 10 hours to collect it overnight. So it can be a bit of a time sink to collect this much data. And then the final data set, once it's stitched together, I believe was about 20 gigs which is pretty much impossible on most systems to analyze that itself. So we actually ended up getting it. We had to break it back down into sections to start analyzing it and bring it back. So when you're doing all this, you really want to think about, hey, this is the data I want to get out of it. What's kind of the lowest resolution I can actually use for it? Um, and then be able to do your data analysis um, later on on it. Um, and also time um, on the instrumentation. So the next um, example I want to talk about, so this is actually from Marza, um, the slide she sent me. Um, so if you're interested in hearing more about this, you want to talk to her about it. She's um, definitely the expert um, here in how to do this kind of work. Um, but it can be really useful for um, a technique called electron channel contrast imaging. Um, so this is from Marza of the um, Grassman Research Group here in Material Science. And kind of um, what you can see with ECI originally is if you have a single um, crystal sample and you zoom out basically as far as you can go, your beam's going to be rastering across the entire thing and you're going to be hitting different diffraction planes as you go. So you actually get this electron channeling um, image. And as soon as you get that, you can rotate um, tilt to be able to get on the zone axis you're interested in and then kind of zoom in on that area. And from that, you can start to see um, different kinds of dislocations, defects in your samples. Um, again, um, if you're trying to zoom in, just these small defects, it works pretty well this way. But as you can see, if you zoom out, you end up with a bunch of different orientations. So um, what they ended up doing was actually looking at this by doing maps. So again, you can look at that small area. And instead of actually kind of changing your beam conditions by looking at a large area, you can then start moving the stage um, at those crystallographic orientations to start getting large areas. So you can see these are very long dislocations. Um, they end up doing long maps. This is 250 microns. They went up to uh, millimeters in length to try and understand the total length of um, these kind of defects. And then um, you can also do kind of square imaging as well to characterize kind of more the density of these samples. So. It's a lot of thought process going into, hey, what do I need to actually understand from the sample? What can I do with it? And I think they did a really good job of starting to characterize these um, in the SEM. 
Um, so another example, um, so let's read the rest of my talks, uh, more or less examples of things. Um, this um, impact structure uh, from a serpent mound down South Ohio. Um, this was actually some imaging Carly did um, with Zach Smith from the Griffith uh, Research Group. And what they're really interested in is trying to understand um, kind of the impact uh, features of these. So um, there's a some kind of impact strike um, and you're looking at it a long time later, you wanna know what's going on there. And with optical microscopy, um, this is one of theirs, uh, polarized light microscopy, um, they can start to characterize this a little bit, um, see some cracks in there, but they want to really understand at a higher resolution scale and also elementally what's going on at these cracks. And so what's really nice, uh, I'll show you in a bit as well, is you can correlate um, your images here to your electron micrograph images. So here um, is kind of the more lower resolution maps image of the same sample. And then from there, you can zoom in and take even higher resolutions of very specific parts you're interested in. Um, or since it's higher resolution than the light microscope itself, you can start to actually characterize those cracks quite a bit better as well. Um, so with this, they were really able to start seeing um, how these cracks were forming, propagating through their sample. And they also brought in other samples um, that they produced in lab um, from different um, structures, heating and impact and that kind of stuff to start comparing it to, to kind of understand how this uh, formation has kind of developed over time. But then again, from here, they were really interested in understanding the chemistry of these cracks. So as soon as you get that information, you can start correlating it even further down to um, your elemental information. So here you can see this is a zoom in of that kind of crack area, and they want to identify what is going on here. So if you're looking at just individual grains themselves, um, if you've done EDS mapping before, this is pretty familiar stuff that you look at. Um, you can see it's nice sand, silicon oxide for most of it, but there are also other um, interesting things going on there as far as the mineralogy goes. Um, uh, I found this grain interesting right here where um, you can really pick out the sodium potassium within the single grain itself on the aluminosilicate mineral. Um, but what they were able to do once they uh, basically correlated their data down went to these specific areas they're interested in is really um, show um, the defects and um, where the act propagation was, if it was um, with the cementite or not. So it's kind of cool being able to go all the way down from their images and correlate that together. So another kind of um, interesting um, aspect that takes a lot more work to try and figure out is doing electron backscatter diffraction um, in the SEM. So for everyone that knows anything about EBSD, um, it takes a lot of sample prep um, to get a good sample. You have to prepare a sample, uh, polish it very smooth, um, with really no deformation on the surface to get um, this diffraction on the surface. Um, if you're not as familiar with EBSD, um, what kind of information you're trying to get out of it is going to be phase, orientation, um, grain structure, information from your sample. And um, how this is set up um, is going to be, your beans coming down the column, um, the sample is oriented at um, 70 degree angle, you're going to have diffraction in there, um, and you collect um, the imaging of your Kikuchi bands um, with your camera and do a lot of image processing to start characterizing those a bit as well. Um, and really with these samples, there's a lot of considerations to take into effect. Um, so as you scan out um, further, you're gonna have a difference in your uh, beam angle and thus the diffraction. So you wanna think about that a little bit. Um, most of those corrections have been taken care of by the manufacturers. Um, so I haven't seen too many problems with that. Um, but again, as you're starting to look at larger and larger areas, you really want to do this fast. Um, so the work I'll show you, we did with um, the velocity camera on our Quattro um, SEM. So um, older Hikaris, can, they're gonna be in the hundreds of uh, frames per second. Um, here you can reach up to 5,000 depending um, on your sample prep. 
um, and your sample itself. Um, and also, like for large area, um, your sample will need to be very flat across the entire surface. And that entire flat surface um, needs to be basically perfectly parallel to the stage because you're going to be having a lot of movements in there that can actually start to cause quite a few problems, which we did the data I'll show you. It took us quite a few tries to figure out how to get that oriented perfectly. Um, but EBSD, you end up with um, nice, beautiful images. Um, you'll see a bunch of these. Um, so I'll talk about um, this. And this is going to be your inverse pole figure, which shows your orientation mapping, basically. Um, just to have an idea of that, you'll see a bunch of these, because I think they're really cool looking for this kind of analysis. Um, so um, these first couple ones, um, large areas, I ran them very quickly. It's just going to be nickel, um, just so I can get a nice sample. And there's are actually taken two different ways. If you look at them, um, probably you don't really see much difference, right? They both look like decent maps um, there from the inverse pole figure. But if you start looking at these, um, with the image quality map, so that's going to basically say, hey, how good the pattern collected was. Um, there's going to be a major difference in how these were collected. So this top example um, was a single scan across a couple millimeters. And what this data is really telling you is um, red is going to be good data. Green to black is going to be day where you're not going to be able to index things as well. So with this um, near the center, so maybe about a millimeter or so, um, is about the resolution that you can get um, for this total size of your sample um, by doing that. But if you go back and think about possibly moving your stage as well, then you can start getting um, much higher quality data, even though you might start at a smaller area. So I left the beam conditions the same here. So you could just basically pick out this center section here. And as you scan across your sample, um, you'll have basically an average, much better um, image quality over there. And one interesting thing on here um, was, I'm not sure exactly what this is, but there's an area with um, a larger or a smaller um, IQ. If that had been off near one of the sides here, you might not pick that out. And sometimes phases, if you can't differentiate well with EBSD because they have a similar crystal structure, um, you can go back, look at the data, and and for some of that information from your image quality. So if that's near the edge, you might not have actually picked that out. Um, but there are a lot of caveats to doing this, right? So you want to um, look at smaller areas so you have less distortion, and also probably be doing a bit of overlap to make sure you can stitch it well together. Uh, so if you're looking at this image and um, you have a keen eye, um, What's the, does anyone see how many tiles it is? So it's a single image, two by two, three by three, four by four. It's three by three, I guess. Three by three, yeah. So if you're just looking at it quick, um, it's not a big deal. You can kind of get an overall idea of what's going on with your sample, right? Um, it's kind of nice there, but. Um, the beam alignment in the SEM isn't always perfectly lined up with your stage movement. Um, and there's also slop in the stage and that kind of stuff. So you really want to start thinking about that. So you can see here's the um, corner overlaps of those. And basically, you're going to be off by microns. Um, with alignments and stuff, you can get it lined up very, very well. But that's going to be at very specific um, conditions, which isn't optimal for there. Um, I think I found it. Usually you're about 0.7 or so degrees off um, from trying to line things very well um, in the microscope. So you really want to kind of think about that um, in there. So kind of what you want to do is overlap. This is showing a similar thing. Um, I set up this scan with overlap. So I did a short area, um, a nice long area, and a short area just to see how much um, differences there were. So if you want to start looking at this, then you have to start um, matching these together so you can actually see this grain matches up here. Uh, this one, those grains are matching up. So you'll end up with some kind of structure that's looking like this. Um, so it's, again, it's things you want to start thinking about, um, how much overlap you need on this um, to be able to get some really nice data from it, and also how you want to set up your scan parameters to try and help optimize that. And again, if you're interested in really long grains, 
or something, you want to make sure your scan parameters are set up so you can get the whole thing. You don't end up with anti cropping on top or bottom. Um, so um, that's kind of the prelude to um, one nice example that we did recently um, with Brian Wolf from the Fraser Group. And so this was an additive manufacturing sample um, that they had previously looked at um, quite a bit um, in SEM. Um, I think they published about two. I don't have the um, citation here. But basically, what they're doing, um, build up layer by layer, and you're starting to add in um, a secondary element to it. So you have your titanium, and then um, another element, so like iron or something into it, and kind of seeing how the microstructure is changing as you increase it. Uh, if you're more interested, again, in this kind of research, definitely reach out to Fraser Research Group as um, they know a lot more about this than I do. But previously, when they looked at this, they looked at kind of small areas. So again, that one by one millimeter or smaller areas. And they could go down to the bottom of the build and see, hey, we have kind of large structures here going on. Keep looking up. OK, there's some kind of transition going on as you're going there. And at the end, when there's a higher concentration of these added elements, you get um, smaller grains and more um, difference in your grain structure from there. But again, with this, you don't know what's going on between those. So we ended up on taking the sample back um, and doing a large area mapping on it. Um, so this example we did, it's almost 30 millimeters across, five millimeters tall um, at, um, I believe we did one micron step size. So um, with this, we actually only took us about two and a half hours to run. Um, it took us three tries to get it there. Um, but as soon as we were able to optimize all the parameters, um, it actually went fairly quick. Um, I'll say again with the, yeah. What, what frame rate were you running? At that time? Uh, we were at about 2,000. Okay. Yeah, so frame rate of 2,000. Um, How big was the data file that we done? So we actually ended up doing it in three different sections. <laughs> um, again. How much would be sections? What? How much would be section? I don't remember the data size. I, I upload the data to Brian and yeah. had him deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really nice. That's, the nice thing about my job is um, I don't worry about the data size too much. Um, and we did this um, also without um, overlap. Um, so there were large enough grains. We weren't worried about that too much. It's more to see kind of the overall structure of it. If you did go back in there, overlap, you have to, um, it does save them all individually. Um, so then data processing might be a little more tedious, but not too computationally intensive. We have to process each individual one and then go back into our program and then stitch them together. Um, so it's, if you're trying to look at very large areas, um, this kind of technique, it does save quite a bit of time, uh, especially using the velocity camera. Um, but um, with the slower cameras, if you're looking at a smaller area, um, speed doesn't really... It helps you a little bit. You might get down a little bit faster, but where we found here at CMS that really helps is like trying to look at larger areas um, or in situ kind of experience where you need to um, characterize it once, um, do some experience on it, characterize it again and again um, during it. So like during a tensile test. Um, I know it has nice data from that from a previous talk as well. OK, so that's kind of um, on the EBSD side of things. Um, I mentioned a few other applications um, since I've mostly been on the material side of things. Um, so two other major applications that I've thought about um, using large area mapping for is either um, cathodoluminescence luminescence um, or low vacuum ESIM imaging. So it depends what kind of cathodoluminescence luminescence detector you have, but if you have a cathodoluminescence luminescence detector that um, you're collecting all the light from it, um, you're using some kind of parabolic mirror that has a focal point. Um, so with that focal point, um, as soon as you start scanning further and further away from here, um, so this is going to be total signal on a flat surface, um, you start to lose intensity. Um, you'll start to have just different aberrations going on where it's going to be scattering at different angles, and you'll start to lose actually quite a bit of signal there. So you have to think about, how do, again, how do I want to do my analysis? Do I actually care if I'm losing a lot of signal? Am I just looking, hey, there's that scratch um, or whatever on the surface? you can zoom out to fairly large um, or fairly low magnifications there. 
But if you're trying to get um, defects that have a lot less signal or something, you want to be kind of in that area of um, tens of microns and then um, go ahead and stitch those back together. Um, we haven't, I haven't actually done that too much um, as examples. So I have an example of that. Um, but I will have an example of what we use low vacuum ESIM imaging for. Um, so as soon as you get to low vacuum um, to um, ESIM imaging, you're going to have to put a pressure limiting aperture on the end of your pole piece. Um, so this is kind of the field of view you're limited to. It's a 500 micron aperture. So if you're trying to look at square images, you're really limited to what, two, 300 microns or so across. Um, so then if you're looking at small areas, it's not too big of a deal. But if you're trying to look at large areas, it gets to be a bit more of an issue. So um, this is actually a slide um, from my Institute talk again. Um, but it's a really nice example of um, how we use this. Um, so these samples were from Ali in the Holtzola Research Lab on um, mechanical engineering. And what they were interested in looking at um, were their um, hydrogels that they used for tissue engineering, their structure. Um, most of the work they had done previously with these samples, they had um, done a fixation technique so that they could be looked at dry. Um, sputter it, look at an SEM via dry, or have it nice dried out um, and do some micro CT on it to look at the large structures um, that they printed from them. But we want to understand, hey, how close to um, similar are those to the um, actual environment when they're wet? So we started to look at this um, in ESIM. And again, you're able to get nice high resolution in there. But as soon as you're going in there, you're really limited to this very small field of view, right? So we went in um, and used maps to start characterizing this as well. So you're able to actually start um, understanding what's going on on the surface of the entire sample here. So you can see it's water there. Um, and I think it's really fun experiments um, where if you look at these three, one of these was in the SEM for two hours and pulled out, the other two were left and water, and there's really no difference between them. So it's, it's the center one that we pulled out SEM after a couple hours. Um, the entire work, I think, was an hour, but I left in there longer just to see um, how, if at all, it had changed. Um, so again, here's um, the similar example where if you wanted to, you could correlate it back um, to imaging. So this is just the NavCam photo. You can see a small area in there that we had image total, but um, with that, you're able to actually see down inside the structure that they were trying to look for. So that's um, the overview that I had. So if there's um, additional questions right now, uh, we can talk about those a little bit. And then I'll um, have a little bit of a demo on kind of maps. So on the EBSC stitching, are you just moving an X still? You're not able to move in Y? So uh, we did X and Y there, and yeah. Y. So yeah, it can be a little problematic moving X and Y because yeah. then you get the tiling down there. Exactly, yeah. And then is there like an interpolation strategy for the focus or are you not moving so far and Y to where it's um, affecting your work conditions? So yeah, that was one of the, the first things we did was when I put it in the first time, um, the sample was very slightly tilted. Right. So as soon as you're slightly tilted, you can actually see it in the image quality map as well. Mm -hmm. We had a nice streak right down the middle. Yeah. That was really good data. On both corners, it was bad data. So it was a bit of time like, OK, we know that's from there. Yeah. Work on trying to figure out how big of an area we can do, how to make sure it's really flat in the SEM. Yeah. When you're stitching it, what are you using? Um, so in that case, it's just assuming the movement's perfect and putting them next to each other. Okay. Which, if, you're try if you don't care about a few percent error, um, it's a decent way to do it. Um, but if you're either grains are small, um, like in the case of the nickel, um, or you really need high precision, then you'll want to collect them all separately um, with like overlap, and do the analysis, and then use another software to stitch them. Uh, they don't have the actual stitching software in the EDEX software. Okay. And I think in a TSL, you can manually stitch things together. It's not perfect, but and now I am. You can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not great, but 
but yeah. you can do it. I know there's nice ones. And then, yeah, if you were actually looking at my image a little bit more, you could see that I didn't line it perfectly up. Um, I just lined it up X and Y. There's a very slight rotation as well. So you really need some kind of decent software to do X, Y rotation on there to make it look nice. <laughs> we have a couple questions on the chat. Okay, chat so, questions. So I'm going to ask, have you tried TKD large area maps? Uh, no. Um, so I don't know of a good use for TKD with large area map. I guess if you have a large sample, you large sample that's already thin somehow, you can look at it, but Normally, TKD, you're trying to do, look at some very small um, grains anyway. And the area that you have thinned well enough um, and, <laughs> yeah, well enough, thin enough, um, uniform enough is going to be microns anyway um, if you do a good job of it. So I haven't seen a good application for that or tried it yet. But if you have something, it'd be fun to do. All right. And Samanti asks, is it possible to image large area fracture surfaces since I am sure the focus might need to be changed for different regions? So yes, imaging wise, I can, I don't have a good example of it, but in the map software, I'll um, show you where the function is. Um, but so the map software that I'll be working through is Thermo. They have, do have a nice stitching algorithm with it. In addition to stitching X, Y together, um, you can make a focal stack as well. So you could set up um, an imaging stack from the top to the bottom of your focus. Um, also, you can set it up to um, run as autofocus for each individual frame. If you do that, then it takes a bit longer, but it might do that. But if you do that, you have a lot of topography on there. It'll change focus between there. Air stitching probably won't be great. All right, so Monty has a follow up question. Are there any tips you have to avoid drift while large area maps? Has it ever been a problem during, say, one of your 28 hour long maps with Mayo? Um, so it'll really depend on your sample, right? So um, for EBSD, it'll be more of an issue than for regular maps. maps you have a nice flat sample. In Mayo's case, it was nice conductive, so there wasn't much drift going on there. Um, the instruments are very stable over hours of time, especially if you're sleeping overnight and no one's coming in disturbing things, so that much problems there. But um, it can be a problem for EBSD. You're tilted at 70 degree angle. Gravity starts to work against your sample and things will move a little bit. Um, you've probably even seen that before. Um, often what I'll do um, is even just, but I'm doing like a large area, I'll get my sample set up, tilted, get everything set up, even wait a half hour or so, make sure things aren't moving too much before starting the analysis. And doing that, your beam will be a little bit more stable uh, after about half an hour, especially at high currents, or um, your sample will stabilize as well. Okay, yeah, feel free to ask more questions. I'm going to pull up the map software real quick. Okay, I'm just standing. And I'll kind of show you that. Um, and feel free to ask questions during that um, as well. We also have another question. I'm thinking it might be a post discussion. Um, but if you want to hear it, let me know. Uh, sure. Mohammed says, I have a project on metallic glass matrix composites. I am looking to image them. Please advise both proprietary and non-proprietary routes. Samples are already published for a past study, and then they reference uh, okay. publication. Yeah, yeah. send me an email. Okay. Um, or if you take a note of that, I'll follow up with it afterwards. It sounds like it's going to be a little more in-depth that way. Great. OK. so. Let me finish set up. Um, so yeah, right now I'm just um, remote into the Quattro SEM uh, SMAP software. It's going to be available on um, any of the three um, SEMs, Aprio, Quattro, uh, SEMs as well. And sorry, with this sample, I'll be switching between two screens quite a bit. And I found it interesting. There is a small tensile sample um, that Actually, that's some nice small features on it. And in this case, we hadn't 
stretched it yet. So it could be interesting if you're looking at a tensile sample or something, uh, image it before, after, start doing that correlation together. So um, in maps, normally kind of my workflow is I already opened and saved my file, but you can import your images. So in this case, I'm just going to import Navcam photo. Um, and as I talk to most people about this, um, I say Navcam will get you approximately to where your sample is. Um, it won't get you much closer than basically where the stub is. But if you need to align it, find anything better, you can often do that. So what I'm actually going to do first is align the sample um, so I can do that kind of correlation and then figure out what I'm doing from there. It's not always a needed step, but it's a nice thing to have um, to know how to do in case you're looking for a very specific area. So go over there, I'll take a quick snapshot here. And you can see, so the corner set up here, whereas in the nav cam, it's here. So it's off by a millimeter or so. Not too bad. You could figure out where you are. But start looking at this. Let's uh, align this. Um, and you can do one, two, three point alignment. Um, the two point alignment is kind of the best way to do things. So I'll choose point one here. Here. Um, so with the 2D or two points, it'll fix rotation, magnification. If you do three points, um, that'll help account for any kind of um, tilt of your sample. Um, if your sample's flat or close to flat, um, I've completely messed things up before by doing that. If you're off by a little bit, it'll start tilting things and you'll have some major problems there. So one corner, let's move to the other corner. Sample. And with these, I'm not worried about trying to get anything uh, of a decent image. It's just to get something started. Again, you can see the problem with that is I don't do any brightness and contrast, but I can still see the corner at least. So, point two. Um, and this image isn't great anyway, so if you have a better high resolution image, um, then your correlation could be a lot better. So from there, you can see how my alignment looks. Uh, it looks pretty close to there, so good enough for what I want to do. Um, you can do a little fine adjustments as well if you need to, but we'll do that. Okay, so as soon as we get there, um, then we kind of want to start setting up our imaging parameters that we're interested in. So on this sample, which I'll start here, um, I probably want to image right near the center. So I can actually just double click here. It'll navigate me right to the center. I double click on. There we go. And now since it's aligned, that's pretty much the exact position I'm interested in. Um, so here I have my ETD and my backscatter detector inserted. Um, we see what kind of features are in here. Um, with this sample, um, it looks like it's been etched or something. So there's, you see some different grains in there, maybe some um, other phases as well. So now you can see the backscatter, it's a different one. So um, let's say this is kind of the image you want. You can start to resolve those features a little bit. And looking at this, it's a little bit grainy. So I just increase my dwell time. Let's look at these and see how they look. Let's actually focus as well. Focus a little bit here. So let's call that basically what we're interested in looking at. So if we come over to the microscope, it's, um, the software itself, we can start creating tile sets. So it depends how big of an area you want to look at. I might want to look at like an entire area here. Um, and then to start setting the parameters here, um, it's nice you can actually just pull them in directly from the microscope. So if I click from microscope, it pulls those in um, and it tells me those parameters. You can see um, how many tiles this will actually be once you zoom in. So it's 
it'll end up being what almost 3,000 images and 10 gigs. Probably you don't want to deal with that, so you want to think about a way to um, either look at something in lower resolution or look at um, kind of a smaller sample size. So in this case, I'll just shrink it down once I'm thinking about this. Maybe you do want to, I don't know. But we'll just look at kind of a smaller size here of this. So again, now 234 um, frame times four seconds. So it should only take tens of minutes to actually look at this, right? Um, again, it's nice cooking from microscope, um, pulled in information about electron beam, tile size, um, resolution, um, the dwell time. But well, it's set up to three microseconds. That's one fine. One looks fine there. It might be a little noisy here. I'll bump up to three. So 10 seconds. It'll take long. Well, we won't run through the whole thing. Um, so that's nice if you can pull that in from there. Um, then this kind of goes back to Samanti's question a little bit, um, is how you want to set up focus on this. Um, so you can do none, which leaves focus as it is, fixed. Um, we'll set it to the focus you do if you're doing multiple areas. Um, for flat samples, I really like interpolated um, imaging for this. So from here, um, it'll interpolate between them, so you can choose kind of three locations. I'll go one. Zoom in on that. Focus. Set point one. It doesn't really matter what order you do things in. I'm going to go. Area set point two. Um, I do like to do the last point, um, or at least focus near the center anyway. So I'm going to do my best focus dig here as well. So focus information again for the resolution we need. Only spend as much time as you um, think you need for the resolution. But that looks good to me. And you can set that third point. So it'll interpolate basically on the um, dimensions there as far as the height goes. That's why you have three points. Um, I mentioned focus stack. So again, you can do this um, how many planes you want. So you can set your top, bottom planes, um, the number of planes you want, and then your focal depth there. So if you do have something with a lot of um, basically structure to it, that you're interested in looking at over a large area, you can. Um, use a focal stack over this or over a single one. Again, if you have two planes, it's going to double your time, three, triple it, that kind of stuff. So you really kind of want to be aware of how long it's going to take um, for your own analysis even later on. Um, there are a bunch of auto functions as well. So again, you could set up auto focus, auto stigmation for every frame, but you have your eight second plus move, stage movement plus doing your auto functions. That can take quite a bit of time. So if you can get with not using those, um, it's a good thing to use. Um, and then there's kind of some more advanced ways to start thinking about your data. So um, it didn't pull any line integration data in there. So if you're worried about charging, um, you can put integration um, into here through line integration. Um, choose how much overlap you need. Um, and it can be a little counterintuitive with overlap when you think about it. Um, so it's going to be um, how off the stage is plus also um, the slop in the stage. So if you do really zoom into a high magnification, you often need a slightly bigger overlap because let's say the stage, actually the stage is one micron. One micron at a millimeter is going to be a very small error. But if you're doing it at 10 microns, that's 10% already of your image plus other ones, you'll have to go up to 20% or so. So you want to think about that when you're doing the work quite a bit as well. Um, then you can adjust your other beam conditions as well. So those were already set from what we were interested in. Yeah. Yep. Can you do frame integration while you do that? Um, I don't see it on here. I haven't tried it. Um, most of the mapping I do on here, I just try and avoid any of that kind of stuff. Um, so if you have any kind of charging or anything, um, 
what you'll even see between frames and whatnot, um, if you're using low vac mode and that kind of stuff, your brightness and contrast will change between them and the stitch images kind of start to look terrible from there. So yeah, I don't see the option here to do that. Um, let's see, let's, oh no, here it is, here you go. In the original one, you can choose frame integration. So frames one, oh, okay. you can do it there. Um, but again, it's one of those things, try to avoid that kind of stuff as much as possible. Um, if you can do a nice single slow frame, that's always going to be um, preferred over doing any kind of integration. Which, yes, integration here. Um, so frames, it doesn't look like it'll have any drift correction there as well. So if you do have movement in there, you'll be losing resolution from that. Oh, there's there's some kind of drift correction here you can do. Sorry. There's always features I haven't thought about or looked at before, so it's nice when there's questions, I can start looking for them and try and find out where they are. Um, stage rotation, you can set the stage tilt rotation on here. I know that was uh, important for doing, oh, sorry, I need to head up, uh, for doing the Aki work to try and lock in that information. Raster scan, um, serpentine or spiral. Um, I prefer serpentine, so it goes back and forth. It saves a little bit of time plus your imaging conditions stay more similar between um, lines going back and forth. Um, we'll save both displays here, and let's stitch to display two. You really do have to set that ahead of time. Um, stitching, you can do that. So yeah, basically that's ready to go. And since that's set up, we click run. And you can estimate your time ahead of time, or it'll tell you how long it's gonna take here. Um, so. Also, let that start running. Well, not let it run for too long. So I know we're getting close on time here. So I'll let a few frames run real quick on there. Um, were there any other questions, Ashley? Yes. Cool. Um, have you tried LAM with Oxford system? Uh, so we just have EDAC software here. Um, so I haven't done as much with um, other vendors. Um, I know there's a, other vendors have a lot of other good options as well. Um, if you're primarily working at CMS, um, yeah, we have um, primarily EDAC software for EDS, EDSD, um, which can be convenient. Um, but yeah, there are some definite um, gaps in their software that can be filled by, um, I know Oxford has some really great software as well. I can confirm for EBSD software, the Oxford system software, is a pretty good large area on that one. Do they have stitching software within it? Yeah, just it's internal for the program. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so it's nice. Like with this, I'll show you in a second. Um, it's nice internal stitching software that they've, they put, they must put a lot of effort into this. So, that's why it's nice. I can do a demo with it um, and not be too worried about any kind of problems going on. Um, other software takes a little bit more effort to kind of do um, to try and get working. So if we let this run, um, you can see the estimate went from six minutes up to about 36 minutes now. It gets better as it goes along once it knows how long each frame's actually taken. And I'm not going to make you guys sit around for that entire time, um, but if you always want to, you could queue up multiple jobs and let this sit for a couple hours and kind of do the work for you when you go and get a coffee. Is this the new, is this the latest version of the map? Or is this the... This is 311. This is, this is the 311. This is on the Aprios and the Quattro. Okay. Um, I'm, it's, I think it's about a year old, so I'm sure they have um, some slightly new features, but I haven't explored that yet. There wasn't any upgrade in the past few months. No, okay. it's 311. And so the software, it's um, not... So if you take a collection like 311, you can't open it in 3.7. Um, but like 3.7 or something, you can upgrade here. Um, just always make a note of what version you're using there, just so you can do work with it later on. There's free um, software online to view it, but in order to do any of the analysis and stuff, you have to kind of do the stitching on the computer itself. Any questions, Ashley? That was it. Perfect. Oh, one just came in. You have mentioned EDF software. Do you have possibility to build new CIS? Or 
personal information files for this? I'm not sure. Maybe expand? Yeah. If it's a file format or something. Yeah, I think that's related to EBSC, but it's a sure file format. It. Anyway, well, again, clarity on that. Um, so you have your tile set here, and um, initially, um, you can see if you zoom in a little bit, um, there's overlap. Um, you could look at it and see where those are. So then if you want to, you can stitch this together. My mouse isn't working to stitch right now. Come on. Oh, no, CIF, crystal information file. Oh, CIF. Um, I'd have to look back and see what files they have. If you talk to them themselves, then you can. Um, see what they have and how to do things as well. Okay, so I think the problem was it still wants to run the job. So I think if I cancel this, I can get to acquire. What's the problem with stopping something in between? It will have problems trying to do anything else with it. Anyway, so you'll take my word for it. Um, I'll figure out how to do this later. I know as soon as you stop something in the middle, there's a specific way you have to go through it to do the stitching, um, either that or all right, quits working. Um, but the software is fairly easy to do stitching with. Um, it'll bring up all your tiles that you're interested in looking at um, and automatically stitch them together. If it's having problems trying to align them, you can manually do some alignment in there as well. Um, and saving it, you as a small file, you can save it down to a TIFF um, or a raw image, um, which gets to be thinking about how to deal with your data as well. So, and another question come in: What are the additional things to consider in EBSD LAM? Is this the same software to do LAM on EBSD, or do you do this in OIM data collection? So, um, there are. There are a few different softwares on there. So OIM DC is actually getting defunct by um, EDAX, and it's not supported with Windows 10. So in this, um, the software I used was the um, new Apex software uh, for it, um, which is actually a really nice um, upgrade over using the team software. And so from there, it creates it. It doesn't do any analysis in the Apex software. Um, they still do support OIM analysis, so then it exports it and you do all your analysis or as much as you want to, unless you want to do something else, OIM analysis. Cool. Um, I think we've got about one minute in. Mohammed is still interested in CIF, so I'll have you follow up. Okay, yeah, I'll follow up with that. Great, and it is 12.30. 12.30. All right. that pretty well. Cool. Thank you, Dan. Okay. If you guys have any other questions later on, let me know. I'll be talks for the rest of the semester as well as I showed before. So I'll talk to you guys later.